Hi there, I'm Kirsty Turpey and welcome to an exploration of buildings that housed vibrant artist communities. I'm an artist and designer based in Dumfries and for the past few months I've been running um, talks for Blueprint 100's Open Studio which is on a Tuesday night at the stove. So for tonight's talk it's time to go all the way back to the 1880s um, which is when the Hotel Chelsea was made, um, which is an, a very famous hotel in New York that has housed many, many famous artists, poets, poets musicians, and many people from all over the years. Um, so, some people say that home is where the heart is, but with the Hotel Chelsea, it is home is where the art is. And I've recreated the Hotel Chelsea in my own home. So welcome. Welcome to the Hotel Chelsea Dumfries style. Oh, look at all that artwork on the walls. Whoa, way out, man. Whoa. This place is nice. Here I am in my room at the Chelsea Hotel and I'm going to tell you a bit about its history. So as I said before it was built in 1883 in New York and it was designed by Philip Hubert in the Victorian Gothic style and one of its standout features is that, is, is that it has a grand staircase that goes 12 stories up and when it was first built it was the first apartment um, building in New York to have a variety of different sized rooms so that a mixture of people could live side by side. It was also the tallest building in New York at the time and the first um, apartment block to also have a bar, restaurant and nightclub. Oh, and a ballroom in it. So, yeah, it was... Um, must have been quite attractive at the time to live there. Um, it was also in the centre of New York's theatre district, so um, straight right from the beginning there was a lot of art artists living there. A couple of years later, because the theatre district moved to a different part of New York, um, the hotel went bankrupt. It was then uh, opened again in 1905, um, and between 1939 and the 1970s, it was run by three partners, Joseph Gross, Julius Cross, and David Barr. In the 1970s, it then uh, the management got taken on by David Bard's son called Stanley Bard, who was actually one of the reasons that it became such a thriving creative community. So Stanley Bard actually said that there was no other building in the world that catered to that many creative people. And he said that there, he felt that there was some sort of mystique in the walls that helped people to produce art there. He often let tenants um, away with not paying their rent for months and even years. Um, and to make sure that he knew that he was going to get the payment at some point, he um, asked them to give them to give him a piece of their artwork to put up on the walls um, so that he knew that he was going to get his painting, uh, his payment at, at some point. Um, and I suppose he probably just wanted some of their artwork just in case they did become famous as well. Um, but yeah, he definitely was a big supporter of everybody that lived there and um, really wanted to see them do well. Um, and he sort of yeah, helped them to live an alternative lifestyle. He also said that he was up for each person doing their own thing there as long as it wasn't destructive to the hotel. So I'm going to go on to say a little bit about um, who lived there and what they said about the hotel over the years. Um, so 
Marilyn Monroe's ex-husband, Arthur Miller, described the Chelsea as having an indescribably home-like atmosphere. Um, he also said that in the 60s it seemed to combine two atmospheres, a scary optimistic chaos which predicted the hip future, and at the same time the feel of a massive old-fashioned sheltering family. So the residents cherished this, uh, the hotel's family atmosphere, and uh, one of a choreographer that lived there, Merle Lister, said that this is the kind of place you can borrow a cup of sugar or practice a dance routine in the hall. Um, so I don't know about, about you, but I've often been given strange looks by neighbours and flatmates because I'm making artwork in the house or wearing weird outfits. Um, but at the Chelsea Hotel, this sort of thing was celebrated. So the lobby was a happening place on the bottom floor where people went to relax, read, meet, gossip, jam with musicians or view the excitement of the night. Uh, photographer Linda Troller, who lived there for years, recounted that you could just get dressed up and go and sit in the lobby and you were bound to bump into somebody that you knew that was probably going out to an exciting party or a gallery opening. So yeah, it was just a, an exciting place to be and you, you could make new friends or bump into people that you knew. Um, but however, people didn't need to go out to find fun because there was plenty of that in the building itself because people kind of, a, a, every, a lot of people that lived there um, decorated their rooms in a really interesting creative way and they would hold extravagant parties in their rooms and um, also people could hire out people's rooms if they wanted to use it for a project like say they wanted like to film because they liked the way that somebody had decorated their space or they liked the size of their room better they could um book it out um um, yeah, as I said before, they also had the bar, restaurant and nightclub in the hotel, so that's where a lot of the residents hung out. Um, there was also many famous people that spent either spent the night there or spent time living there. However, um, musician Patti Smith said that up-and-coming artists didn't really bother the more famous ones. Um, because it was a different time back then and only photographers had um, cameras so there wasn't people running around trying to take selfies with famous musician, musicians. Um, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, Janis Joplin, Nico, The Velvet Underground and many other um, musicians at the top of their game stayed at the hotel. The things that it's most famous for is that in 1953, the writer Dylan Thomas became ill and died there several days later. In 1959, the beat poet William Burroughs wrote his first novel, Naked Lunch. In 1966, Andy Warhol's superstar Eddie Sedgwick set fire to her room um, because she fell asleep with the candles burning and was therefore uh, thereafter considered such a liability by the hotel staff that they moved her into a room above the lobby where she could be monitored. In 1969, in room 1017, famous for being the smallest in the hotel, um, that became Patti Smith and Robert Maplethorpe's for $55 a week. And in her bi biography, Just Kids, um, she said that it was a tremendous stroke of luck to land up there, to dwell in this eccentric, and Damned Hotel provided a sense of security as well as a stellar education. And that education included Robert, Ma Robert Maplethorpe's um, first introduction to photography, which is what he's famous for, because um, he bumped into another artist that was living there called Sandy Daly, whose room was completely white, except from silver helium balloons, which is an example of one of the strange ways that people decorated their rooms. Um, she lent him her Polaroid camera and Maplethorpe took his first pictures and then made a career out of being a photographer. Uh, many uh, hit songs were written in the hotel including Leonard Cohen's Chelsea Hotel No. 2 and Bob Dylan's Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands which was about his ex-wife. 
And one of the hotel's most notorious incidents was in 1978 when Nancy Spungen, who is girlfriend, who was girlfriend of Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols, was found stabbed to death, which is a little bit gruesome. So the hotel um, stayed a place for creatives um, coming and going and living there permanently up until 2011. Um, but it has now been bought over and turned into a boutique hotel, which is more commercial. Um, there are, however, some of the long-term residents that still live there, but definitely isn't the place that it used to be. But a lot of people still go there um, and stay there overnight just because of its history and um, all of the things that went on there. But although it's changed nowadays, one of the amazing things is that it was this sort of hub of creativity and this place that was so accepting of the alternative lifestyle for so many years. Um, and that, it, yeah, for decades, it was, it was a, a place where many exciting things happened. I definitely wish that I could go back there and experience some of these amazing parties that they had there and see all the artwork that was up in the halls. Um, but there, that's not something that I can do. Um, but something that I do feel really lucky to have here in Dumfries is the Stove Network, um, which I'm sure many of you have experienced and I feel that it definitely has a lot of this, the same sort of energy that was not only in the Chelsea Hotel but also in Andy Warhol's factory and the Beatles Apple Boutique. It's got that same sort of buzz around it where there's um, ideas and potential and lots of people doing lots of different creative projects and it's definitely a really welcoming and supportive place. Um, so yeah, so uh, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to explore all of these different artist communities of the past because I wanted to show just how much the stove is sort of creating that same sort of place that is really supportive of people um, living and expressing their ideas. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk tonight and goodbye from the Chelsea Hotel.